so my presentation here is called um, Is Protest a Luxury? Evidence from post um, ISIS of Rockets with two co authors who, uh, who are not here. Uh, so I'll be representing the team, of course. Uh, and you know, the, the paper sort of are empirically we're focusing on this really um, massive and powerful protest movement in Iraq that erupted in 2019 called the Tishreen protest movement. Some folks may be uh, pretty familiar with it. Others it may have caught their attention and then and, and sort of slipped by um, in the very tumultuous last couple of years. But it, it really was sort of the largest a protest movement in, in modern Iraqi history, and it was notably uh, a pan-sectarian um, protest for good governance and for a civic state, which really um, represented a powerful vision. So we were asking why people, why people support these kinds of protests, especially in societies um, like Iraq, where um, insecurity is so is so salient. This was only two years after, of course, the, the defeat of, of ISIL um, in the country. And so we want to understand how that insecurity um, may uh, influence the ability of these protests to succeed um, in these societies. And, and we think it's such an important and salient question because, um, as I was alluding to, this these kinds of protests represent, I think, one of the most promising pathways out of conflict traps for countries like Iraq um, that have been caught in cycles of sectarian uh, violence um, for, uh, for the many years um, towards a, a, a different kind of politics um, that doesn't make that so likely just beneath the surface. And a similar movement um, uh, meanwhile, has happened um, in Lebanon as well in recent years. So, so we think there's some something really interesting going on, and we want to look at the attitudinal dynamics behind it. So, a little bit just to give you the landscape, the lay of the land uh, of the um, protest support in the country. So, you can see that it's very popular overall. So, over 70 percent. Uh, as I, I alluded to, I wasn't, you know, I have the numbers to back that up. It's, it's a very um, broadly appealing protest movement. And then also you see reinforcing the other point that I made earlier, um, that level of uh, supermajority appeal among both uh, Sunnis and, and Shia in the country, which makes it somewhat, um, which is more pronounced than, than among the previous protest movements that the country has seen. Um, that said, there, it's still, um, you, you know, un, not unexpectedly, um, uh, that support is, is um, you know, sort of maximized most among the Shia. This, the, the movement sort of started in, uh, among the sort of Shia underclass in Iraqi society um, and has been most salient there. And, and, you know, some of the dynamics we highlight about how fears of insecurity and war uh, sort of hamper this movement um, have some sectarian overtones as well. Um, so I won't um, linger on the literature too much. We have a pretty standard literature review <laughs> in our protest-oriented paper. Uh, we'll talk about um, two of the biggest strands of, of research on protest and rebellion those on grievances um, and opportunity structures. I think most of us have heard some of that language before. So I think we view, you know, this, there's a tremendous amount of useful literature. We are trying to intervene in a couple of ways. One of them is we think there's room for um, a, a, a framework that um, integrates some of these ideas and creates room for some other ones from psychology. And um, that's coming from classic work on motivational psychology, which drawing on, you know, the sort of uh, seminal writings of people like Maslow, uh, 
really focuses on human motivations and the hierarchy of human needs and how uh, we tend to um, uh, be really distressed and upset if we're unable to fulfill our needs, especially the most sort of fundamental needs that we have. And so we focus on three needs that we think are especially influential um, as a way to sort of synthesize this, needs for security, sustenance, and significance. Significance, just really briefly on these, significance is um, sort of the most, the, the, the most uh, uh, existential need in a way. It's a, it's a need about, um, you know, being respected, having a voice in society, having control over your, your own affairs, and so on. Um, whereas the others are a little lower on that uh, needs hierarchy. So sustenance is about being materially comfortable. Um, of course, that's tapped into by having your basic um, uh, service needs and um, employment needs met and all that, and then security. And I think it's those lower rungs on the ladder that we think have at times been neglected, and this sort of motivational theory can help us remind us that um, those can obviously disrupt your... Um, uh, you know, drive to fulfill those higher needs, um, which a protest movement like this uh, might appeal to. So that's what we're sort of getting at. And I think, again, that security, you can see the last couple of bullet points, uh, need, uh, we argue, operates differently. When you really have a fundamentally insecure um, community or, or segment of your society, they're going to have a hard time getting behind these more aspirational protest movements, we argue, um, that are seeking broader uh, social significance for individuals, um, as well as fulfillment of, you know, more um, ach achieving a, a reasonable level of a standard of living for folks. Um, and so we argue that when survival is at stake, protests can become, uh, become a luxury. So we have a few uh, uh, drilling down on these and uh, these ideas. We operationalize them in a, a few different ways. Um, that I think I'll, I'll mention briefly because they get at the core, um, the core sort of a, appealing aspects of the protests to Iraqis. So on the significance dimension, uh, corruption, obviously these were heavily inspired by the, the you know, um, uh, resentment about the deep corruption in Iraqi government and society. Um, foreign interference, so to the extent to which um, Iraqis are really upset about um, the, the foreign domination um, by multiple, um, coming, coming from multiple sources of their country. They're also going to be uh, more, uh, find these appealing and drawn to these protests. And um, I think, again, hearkening back to that earliest, that first, uh, one of the first points I made, that they also represented this pan-sectarian um, uh, vision of politics, um, and so to the extent Iraqis are fed up with a, a, a corrupt sect sectarian system, they're really going to be attracted to these. And, and the idea is that all these cohere around ways in which individuals feel that they're disrespected, right, and not given a proper voice in society. So these are sort of some of the core, we would call these grievances, political grievances in the traditional literature. But here we're... Um, in this framework, uh, terming them significance, motivations. Um, so then you also have uh, core uh, sort of sustenance drivers that we would think are, um, have been uh, uh, capitalized on in this movement, um, that it will appeal more to people who are, are unemployed, which is a, a huge problem in Iraqi society. Um, and that don't believe, they're just, they, they feel that they're the have-nots. You know, that's sort of H2A here. They're not materially comfortable. They haven't come out on top in this society, and they want, obviously, um, you know, there's a pretty natural way in which an anti-system protest movement, you know, taps into that. So, sustenance motivations. And then the security ones, which, again, we think is, this framework is a way to help inject these into the literature most, um, here, what's, you know, we think this is our most novel contribution because, um, you know, war is just beneath the surface here uh, of Iraqi society. And so we operationalize this in a few ways. You know, one more traditional Iraqis 
just kind of perceiving their situ security situation more negatively. You'd find that on surveys all over the world. But we also look at, you know, we wanted to really try and capture more acute forms of uh, insecurity. So we look at conflict-induced displacement and um, uh, exposure and proximity to ISIL terror attacks. We've also looked at proximity to coalition airstrikes as sort of observational variation. And we think this is really important because it represents the ways in which some of these communities remember how uh, movements for political change have resulted in, have actually kind of led to war in the past. So we think this is really the pathway that we're trying to get at. And we know it's early stage research, so we hope to kind of substantiate those mechanisms more in the future. I won't bore you with the, uh, or, or have time, I, don't, I can't bore you with the methodological de details of this survey. It's a, a broadly nationally representative survey of Iraq. Um, to the extent that such surveys exist at all. Um, nor will I go over the descriptive statistics, but in the interest of time, I'll show you some of the core results here. Um, essentially, we find support for most of the hypotheses, right? You know, we're not saying that um, insecurity uh, is, is dominating this whole uh, decision-making process about protest support. You're finding you know, that, that support is really powerfully related to uh, uh, these, these significant motivations, resentment about corruption, um, angst about foreign meddling, and belief in, that, that the Iraqi communities, Sunni Shia, and Kurds can sort of solve big problems together. Um, these, these show up, but at the same, and we don't, a little footnote is we don't find much for sustenance type motivation, what we term sustenance motivations. Um, but we do find that these uh, security uh, perceptions and experiences do drive that support down. And, and that taps into some of my broader research on how um, exposure um, and being in uh, security, really insecure situations, fundamentally changes um, political psychology. Um, and, and especially this ISIS uh, violence proximity uh, variable we find is probably the strongest. So um, as a little bit of a, a way of starting to look beyond Iraq, we also, uh, I, I threw together some graphs using Arab barometer survey data cross-nationally uh, just to look at, whoops, how, I'll go through this really fast, uh, how support for very, uh, very cautious, slow reforms uh, correlates with the percentage of people who say that uh, security is sort of the top issue that they face, and you actually do see some interesting, sort of I'd say very suggestive evidence that in some of these places like Libya that now security is um, uh, a foremost on, on, lar you know, on many people's minds that uh, they tend to not be as aggressively hitting the gas in terms of um, support for drastic social changes. We, I, would, I would argue that some of these dynamics may be at work here, um, and a similar, similarly negative relationship um, correlation with um, the extent to which people are protesting versus, again, that domination of, of that fundamental core security mindset. Uh, so that's where we're at. Uh, implications, um, there, there's a lot that's confirmatory in the literature here, but I think this, this we want to think about more of the, the lower rung needs that shape uh, protest support and behavior especially how publics in these regions that have really suffered from protests um, destabilizing their societies, uh, their thinking can be transformed. And we think that is important for scholars as well as for the international community um, to grapple with as we, we look at these protests that we'd like to see succeed. All right, thank you.